you know, I studied engineering for nine years and paid a lot of money to learn that it works better when you turn it on. <laughs> Great to see you. Day three, our last day together. Thank you for how attentive you've been and uh, your great attitudes and your great spirit. I've loved being in this school. I have very high regard for your president, President Kim, and for the administrators. And uh, I spent probably almost probably four and a half hours with President Kim yesterday. He's just got a way of tilting his head and all this stuff comes out. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. He thinks we just spent all, all day talking about discipleship models and how Jesus forms us and shapes us how he wants to see that lived out here among you as a community and uh, as well as in the church in general. So uh, I found uh, my conversations with him, as always, very uh, stretching. Usually when I come to Valley Forge, uh, one of my goals is just to answer the question, I wonder what President Kim's thinking about these days because it's always fascinating, sometimes controversial and always awesome. I'm impressed with him and I'm impressed with you. You... Um, uh, organizations tend to take on the personality of their leaders, the values of their leaders, and I definitely see see you carrying some of that same heart, that desire to, especially I love the way you put it to me yesterday. He said, here at Valley Forge, we just want to be overwhelmed with the beauty of Jesus and be more like him. He was talking my language right now at Central Assembly where I pastor every Sunday morning. Uh, right now, I'm in a series just simply entitled Encounters with Christ. We're going through the book of Luke and looking at not so much the teaching passages, but just how Jesus encountered people. And I'm, I'm amazed at him, the genius relationally he was. And uh, I found this about Jesus. Some days he'll bless you, and some days he'll bother you. <laughs> and I find some days Jesus bothers me. I watch him in the Gospels and... You watch him really closely and say, Jesus, that's so unlike me still. I, I just have so far to go to be like you. Sometimes Jesus makes me squirm because he so confronts the, the kingdom of this world paradigms I still tend to adopt rather than this new kingdom that he came to announce. And uh, the way, he, as a result, he treated people differently. And I come to this morning, we've been talking about humility and brokenness uh, you know, and I, I, can, I, I told you the first morning, I, I don't normally turn those into sermons and preach them a lot, but thank you for allowing me to try to put them and package them that way. I do have a podcast. It's a weekly podcast, about a half-hour podcast, and uh, at jbroadford.org, and um, I do unpack some of these concepts a little, so if, if you've been um, interested in some of these things we've been talking about, especially, especially trying to re- rewire our spirituality into our leadership. Um, I encourage you to listen to those who are just walking through my book on leadership, Leads So Others Can Follow. We're going very slowly. We're in chapter four, and we've been doing this for like, we've had like 35 podcasts already or something. But anyway, we're, we're just, it just is a time to just think more deeply about this. But you guys have been wonderful just to allow me to take some of those concepts and package them in, in some chapel things. But today... I want to see how the, I, I, I want us to explore how this all resolves in the beauty and brilliance of Jesus Christ, and this is where it all comes. And we do it against a backdrop of of the divisions in our nation. We're very divided right now politically. We're very divided racially. We're divided culturally. We're divided economically. Huge divisions right now. And so I wanted to look at Jesus through the lens of Jesus being a barrier breaker. As we're broken, as we walk in humility before God, he then lets us loose on our world. And it's amazing to watch Jesus engage, in this case, in John chapter 4, somebody very unlike him. Somebody very unlike him. And I'd like you to just read, I think on the screen we'll put John chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus was traveling uh, some between the north and south Galilee and the north Judah and Jerusalem and the south. And the shortcut was through an area called Samaria in between. And the scriptures tell us he needed to go through Samaria. And he stopped at this well. And verse 7 says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? And then in parentheses in the next verse, he says his disciples had gone into town to buy food. So here he is, alone with a Samaritan woman by a well. 
engages somebody. And in the process, Jesus is going to overcome four barriers that we're really struggling in our culture to overcome, especially in the church right now. But he'll, over, he'll break. He's the barrier breaker. He has nothing to prove. Remember that's at the heart of humility. The spotlight's not on you. You have nothing to prove about yourself, but he's going to be himself. And he's going to be able to engage somebody who on many levels is very unlike him. And he's going to break four barriers. The first barrier he's going to break is the racial barrier, is the racial barrier. Because he says to this Samaritan woman, uh, will you give me some water to drink? So there are the two of them by a well, and they're talking. Her first reaction is the racial reaction. In fact, she will say, um, are, you, are you a Jew talking to me, a Samaritan? There is unbelievable racial prejudice here between Jews and Samaritans. It would not be an overstatement to say they hated each other. And, and this, this was part of the punch of, of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember Jesus told that? I mean, this Jewish guy gets beat up by the, by the road. Two other, quote-unquote, Jewish religious leaders pass him by. Who's the guy who stops and helps him? It's somebody they hated. And then Jesus, he knows what he's doing. He's just poking at him. And, and, and he just says, so who was the neighbor? Who is the good neighbor? You know, and, and, and they're just forced. And, and they kind of answered him in vague terms. It was, they, they wouldn't even say the Samaritan. They just said, well, the guy who helped him. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and they had no room in their prejudice for this. He was just blowing them up. He was just poking them. Provo- I mean, there are days Jesus blesses you, and there are days Jesus bothers you. And Jesus was just bothering them to expose their prejudice. This, this is it. I mean, Valley Forge is here. It's a part of an Assemblies of God, our, our, our fellowship of churches that grew out of Azusa Street. Azusa Street happened 1906 to 1909 in downtown um, uh, Los Angeles. And it, it was where God sovereignly poured out a spirit for three years. People all over the world end up going there. And the Pentecostal revival, which had become the greatest missions movement in, in, in church history, came out of that. Um, the Assemblies of God came out of that. The church I pastor came out of that because of, a, of someone who was baptized in the Spirit as a street who had a sister in Springfield, and she became the founding pastor when she was baptized in the Spirit of the church I pastor, and now 114 years later. And, and you know, so, so we're in this flow out of Azusa Street. And because people from all over the world were coming, and because it was so out of the box for church life, this dramatic outpouring night and day for three years of the Holy Spirit in a tangible way probably none of us have witnessed, but I pray will come again. Um, it got the attention of the secular media. And like the Los Angeles Times, they would make fun of the Azusa Street in the media for two reasons. Number one, uh, this was just weird for church life. I mean, people would come forward and then they'd fall down on the floor, you know, uh, and no one would push them. It would be the power of God had come on them. And people were speaking in tongues and, and there was such joy that people were just singing and shouting sometimes. I mean, we don't do that in quiet conservative church services. And, and on top of it, on top of it, there was these dramatic healings. And so, and so the media would make fun of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, even though some of them were a little questionable, but revival's messy, but God transformed lives and started a worldwide movement. The other thing the media criticized Azusa Street was for was that blacks and whites worshiped together, as well as Hispanics and Asians. And back in the Jim Crow era, back then, and it just teaches you, uh, don't hook your value system to the values of the popular media. The values of the popular media 100 years ago were that that was totally uncouth. You never had blacks and whites doing things together. But Azusa Street, with their black pastor, Pastor Seymour, he would say, the color line has been washed away in the blood of Jesus. No wonder... No wonder racial prejudice has no rule. I mean, in our wicked hearts, I mean, there, we, we can be prejudiced. We can have preferences. Uh, we can see skin color too much. We can see educational level too much. We can see economic status too much. All of these things need to become invisible to us because those are not kingdom categories. Those are worldly, fallen, wicked human heart categories. 
And they would just proclaim where it was totally culturally unacceptable for blacks and whites to worship together that the color line was washed away in the blood of Jesus. This is what Jesus is doing. He first of all crosses a racial barrier and that's her first reaction. I, you know, Samaritans, Jews don't do that. We, 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 don't, we don't ever belong together. I mean, you're a Jew and you're actually asking me a question. You're actually asking me for something. You're actually depending on me for something. I mean, what a way to bridge a barrier, not to come with, Here, here's my thing for you. Here's where you got to change. He takes the approach of, of could you help me? <laughs> wow. I mean, this was, he broke the racial barrier. He broke the gender barrier. Because in verse 27, his disciples get back from their McDonald's run in town. And they're back with their Big Macs, and they notice Jesus is talking to this woman. And their first reaction wasn't the racial reaction like the woman herself. Uh, no, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We shouldn't be talking to each other. Theirs was the gender reaction. It said they were surprised that Jesus was talking to a woman. And then the next verse, John adds, but they decided they'd better not say anything. <laughs> Probably a smart move. But their whole Jewish background was this, like the rabbis and, and ladies. What I'm going to say pains my heart, but this was their context. Uh, the rabbis would, would pray this way. Thank you, Lord. I am neither a Gentile nor a woman. And they would inc it always encourage Jewish men not to, to talk to women as little as possible. And on top of it, they believed that Samaritan women in particular were ritually unclean from birth and they would be unclean the rest of their life. Now this gender issue, I'm grateful for our fellowship. We've credentialed women for ministry. We, we believe women can be involved in ministry. But I want to tell you, ladies, to whatever degree you have gotten the message from us that you need to be put in your place, forgive us. God forbid you would ever be in a place of being put in your place by the church of Jesus Christ. You know what your place is? Joel prophesied it and Peter quoted it on the day of Pentecost. I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your, and your men and your women will prophesy because I will give your spirit, my spirit to the men and the women, both young and old. So there. Peter quotes Joel, there's no age discrimination and there's no gender discrimination. That's why we believe women can be preachers as well as men, because God's put his spirit on all of them. Well, what about 1 Timothy chapter 2? Paul said, I forbid that women speak or teach others. Well, that was to the church of Ephesus. Paul had left Timothy there to correct false teachers. And Ephesus was the city of one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple to the goddess Diana. There was a feminist idol cult there that was not just teaching feminine equality, it was teaching feminine domination. They were changing with, with some Gnostic twists, they were changing the creation narrative that, that actually God created women more important than men, that it wasn't women who was tempted first by the devil and gave in, it was men, and that, that, that women had these, uh, these packets of light in them and every time they, they, they bore a child, they would lose some of their packets of light and so maybe don't have children and all of these kind of things. And some of these women, because false teaching becomes so, this had infiltrated the church and they were all been house churches, not big gatherings like this, but house churches. And apparently some women were, 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 were the prominent teachers in some of the house churches, and they were teaching this stuff, which was anti-biblical, anti-the Holy Spirit has come upon men and women. They were teaching women are superior to men and all of this sort of thing. And so in that context, in that city, with that feminine idol cult uh, that was teaching female domination, and because Paul's assignment to Timothy was, you need to correct the false doctrine. That's why I'm leading you there. He had to say to that church, I forbid those teachers from teaching in the house churches in Ephesus. That was localized. That was because of the context of that situation. But never does God want to put you woman in your place. We need you stepping up. 
When I became general secretary, I, I, I oversaw the credentialing of ministers. I was grateful. When I became general secretary, 18 or 19 percent of our credential holders were female. Now there's 25 percent. One in four of our credential holders are female. Now we're just praying that God opens more doors of opportunity for you. Uh, if you're a guy, go for it. If you're a woman, go for it. This is Jesus, the barrier breaker, and he broke the gender barrier. I mean, the disciples come with their Big Macs and they're going, oh, I can't believe Jesus is talking to a woman. But they thought, eh, we better not confront him about that, you know, because they just kind of knew they'd get it in the face back. Because Jesus doesn't play to those gender games either. And then he broke the religious barrier. Broke a racial barrier, a gender barrier. He broke a religious barrier. Because the Samaritan religion was sort of this hodgepodge of Judaism and paganism. Jews considered Samaritans little more than religious roadkill. They had no respect for them. Plus, this well, we're told, is at Mount, the foot of Mount Gerizim. 400 years earlier, the Samaritans had built their own temple at Mount Gerizim. But 300 years later, the Jews destroyed that temple. And so the woman's going to go there. And she's saying, okay, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We're supposed to, we're supposed to worship here. And, of course, without even saying it, everybody knows what she's talking about. That temple that those terrible Jews destroyed. But you Jews, she said, you say you're supposed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus just said to her, you're in the wrong ball game. You're not even asking the right question. This is not about Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem. This is about, and I so appreciated that being brought out in the worship by the worship team this morning. This is about spirit and truth. He said, I'm going to give you living water. I'm not talking religion here. I'm talking about spirit and truth. And those who worship the Father are going to worship him in spirit and truth. Because Jesus, Jesus is going to give his body away and die and rise again and pour out his Holy Spirit. And it's not this temple or that. It's not, it's not Ghana or, or the Philippines or United States. It's spirit and truth. It's spirit and truth. It's not in your dorm rooms or in the chapel. It's spirit and truth. That's our location. The location of worship is spirit and truth, not a place, not a tradition. But I'll tell you, this stuff's tough, right? It's hard. Deeply held religious traditions, sacred, sacred rituals, and unforgotten history. I mean, this stuff creates barriers that are almost impossible for most of us religiously to overcome with other people. But Jesus is breaking through that barriers by redefining the turf. This is spirit and truth. And then not only that, but he breaks a lifestyle barrier. It's a racial barrier, a gender barrier, a religious barrier, and then he's going to break a lifestyle barrier. Because this lady is, uh, is a lady with a past that Jesus in his holiness would not normally identify with. This is a lady with a past. Her life had been full of rejection and failure. Uh, she had been shamed by sexual promiscuity. Uh, she had a reputation. And, um, you know, it was at, at a well that Jacob and Isaac met their wives. And here's Jesus talking to this lady alone. The fact that she's out in the middle of the day, we're told it's a six hour, so she's not out early in the day or later in the day with the rest of the women. She's been somewhat ostracized. She's out in the middle of the day. It's at a well where, 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 where you know, there's some very famous, in, in Jewish hi history, very famous stories of men finding their wives. And, and every, scholars tell us everything about the setting with this woman alone. I mean, it had a certain moral ambiguity to it. Nothing bad happened, but... But normally you would want to stay away from the ambiguity of that kind of a setting. But that wouldn't keep Jesus away. Even though everything about his, her lifestyle was so different than Jesus' lifestyle. Because he breaks through the lifestyle barriers. You know, some of, you know, I've talked to Christians, and I understand this. Like, well, I don't have very many non-Christian friends because I don't like their lifestyle. Well, you know what? You've got to get over it. Of course, you're not going to do their lifestyle with them. You're not going to sleep around like they do. You're not going to get drunk like they do. You, but you know what? This, this lifestyle barrier, because just because 
of non-Christians do things that are offensive to us or that we can't believe. Look, why do sinners sin? Because they're sinners. This should not surprise us. And, and, and the lifestyle barrier is one that, you know, there's stuff you're going to have to overlook. There's stuff your non-Christian friends are going to do that, that grieve your heart and are offensive and that you would never allow for yourself. But Jesus still stepped into the risk of that situation. Now, if you're a young believer and you know you could get dragged back in, don't do it yet. But if, if, you, if you've known Jesus more than two years and you're walking in victory in your life, I mean, we got to be breaking the lifestyle barriers and saying, I, I can't let the offensiveness of how the world lives kind of dirty my holy soul. I've got to be willing to be where they are, to love them. Listen, God loves everybody because he created them. God doesn't just love your non-Christian friend because they might become a Christian. God loves your non-Christian friend whether they become a Christian or not, and he wants you to love them whether they become a Christian or not. He wants you involved in their life. He wants you building bridges. He wants you breaking the, even the lifestyle barrier in the hopes that someday they will come to know Christ, although they're still worth loving whether they come to know Christ or not. I mean, if they don't come to know Christ, they're going to have to stand accountable before God alone and, 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 and a just God has got to even the scales of justice for them. That's why hell exists. That's why, that, that, that's why God does honor our free will. We don't want Jesus. God will give us eternity without Jesus, which is hell. But, you know, you, you pray for their salvation, but you love them because that's what Jesus would do no matter what the outcome is. So do, do you hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying? So Jesus, the, he's amazing. He breaks this bar these barriers. He breaks the racial barrier, the gender barrier, the religious barrier, and the lifestyle barrier and redefines the terms, and redefines the terms. And the question is, how does he do it? Especially right now in our culture where, you know, on, um, on cable news, people are just shouting each over each other. It's really hard even to have a conversation with people and disagree with them without the risk now of them thinking that you hate them. I hate this about where we are in our public discourse now, even personal discourse. Like to disagree with somebody is interpreted as I hate them. And, and this, we really need to do the barrier-breaking stuff. And Jesus, Jesus in his beauty and his genius, he did it two ways. First of all, he entered her world, and then he touched her heart. I can say with some authority, this is not rocket science. I know rocket science, and this is not it. But, but it'll take the rest of your life to be more like Jesus in this way. Because he was actually willing to enter her world. I mean, he went to her world. Isn't this what Jesus did for all of us? Did he say, I want you to come up to heaven so I can lecture you about how you ought to live? No. He, first of all, came into our world, right? He emptied himself, took on the form of a man, and then died the most shameful death you could. Why? To meet us at our worst. I mean, I mean, Jesus first beckoned to us was not come to me. He only said come to me after he himself had purposely come to us. And, and we're... What is this transforming church life? I mean, we used to say, come to our church, you know. I think increasingly, we're going to have to go to their worlds. But Jesus entered the world. And he, and he found something he had in common with that lady. She was drawing water and he was thirsty. You know what? This, this was not rocket science. This was just, you know, what do you have in common with somebody? Because sometimes the questions are, sometimes our first questions are things like, how can, that person's not like me, so how can I avoid them? Rather than, how can I build a bridge to find something in common with them? Or sometimes our first reaction to people who are different than us is, I don't like them. Rather than our first question being, if Jesus was to give me his eyes for that person, what could I come to appreciate about them? Or at least find we have in common. And so Jesus entered her world. Jesus didn't wait for her to come to him. He went to her. Maybe there's some people in your life that are just waiting for you to enter their world. You know, there may be some people, even believers, but you're really in conflict with them. You may have some family members and you haven't been talking to each other lately. 
You know, and it's going to stay at a stalemate until somebody has the faith and the guts to start the conversation. And, uh, you know, I just learned, I don't want to be waiting around for other people to do it before me or instead of me. I want to own responsibility in every relationship. I want to own responsibility. Humility and brokenness frees me to, to say, who cares? I'm going to go for it because this isn't about me. And, and maybe you're the one who's got to start the conversation. Yeah, but I don't know what will happen. Well, that's faith, right? You take a leap. You don't know where you're going to land. That's faith. I mean, who knows? I don't know what's going to happen either. But things are going to stay stuck until you enter somebody's world and you start a conversation. And you don't do it confrontably or accusingly or you hate me and all that stuff. You start with trying to find those common values like, hey, we're all a part of the same family and, you know, this isn't fun for any of us. And, and I'm so, if I've done something, you know, I want to be the first, I want to be the first to apologize. I don't want you to be the first to apologize, you to come into my world. I, I want to be like you. I want to go into your world. All of this stuff is what makes this so powerful and so potent. And uh, we, we are in the business, once we come to be okay with who we are in Jesus and just freed by who we are in Jesus, then we, we don't let these barriers stop us. You know, we crucify prejudice and we crucify preference. And just because somebody's different than us or somebody is at odds with us, that no longer becomes a strong enough barrier to keep Jesus away. And so we go as his people. So Jesus entered her world and found something in common with her, water. And then he turned that into a spiritual conversation as she said, why are you asking me for water? And, and Jesus said, well, if you knew who you're talking to, you would ask me for water. <laughs> it, he's brilliant. He said, you asked me for water. Now, she wasn't a farmer, so he's not talking about sowing seeds. She wasn't a fisherman, so he's not t saying, you know, I could make you a fisher of men. No, it's water, right? She said, if you knew who you're talking to, you would be asking me for water because I have living water. And if you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. And then he moves into the second phase of it. He not only enters her world on terms in which she understands and begins to communicate the gospel in terms that she could understand. But then he touches her heart. Think about it. This is a woman who for years has been used and abused and discarded by men. Because he asks her, oh, he knew what I was doing. He's going to touch her heart now. He asks her, by the way, where's your husband? Yeah, don't have a husband. She says, actually, Jesus said, you're right. Yeah, thanks for being honest about that. You're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five of them, and you've just given up on that, and you're just shacking out with the guy you're with now. And... Now, now, this man, Jesus, for this woman who's had nothing but a track record of men who have used, abused, and trashed her life, now this man, Jesus, is going to change the rules of engagement. He's going to expose her secrets prophetically. Get this. He's going to expose her secrets prophetically, but he's going to handle her heart tenderly. There's times to confront people with their sin and there's times to say, hey, look, we all know it. But here's what I've come to do. And being a male, Jesus treats her like no other male had treated her. It wasn't seductive. It wasn't sexual. It was tenderly. And it was in truth. He exposed her secrets prophetically, but he handled her heart tenderly. Isn't that beautiful about Jesus? He does that with every one of us. He doesn't let us play games. He convicts us with the Holy Spirit. He exposes our secrets. But then he handles our hearts tenderly because he created us. He knows how fragile we are. He knows the barriers that need to be overcome in our lives. 
And he says, if you'll come to me. And this is what he did when he came to our world on the cross. There was a surgeon by the name of Richard, Dr. Richard Stetzer. He wrote a book entitled Notes on the Art of Surgery. <laughs> Notes on the Art of Surgery. And he tells an amazing story. And we'll be done here. But this, to me, wraps up Jesus for me who exposes my secrets but handles my heart with tenderness. Because he didn't wait for me to go to his world. He came into my world and did what it took to encounter my heart. Stetzer said, I had to do surgery on a young woman. This would be probably in her 20s or early 30s. There was a tumor in her cheek. I had to remove that tumor. And in the process of removing that tumor, I needed to snip a nerve that would permanently deform her face uh, so that as if she was palsied or something. And it causes her, her, her mouth to be crooked and deformed because she said, I couldn't, I couldn't save her life without snipping that nerve and getting that tumor out. He said, I, I went to visit her in recovery. I was standing on one side of her bed and a guy was standing on the other side of her bed, and I pretty soon realized this was her husband. She looked at me, Dr. Stetzer said, and asked, will my face always be like this? And I said, yes. Unfortunately, it will always be like that because I had to clip the nerve. And her husband across, Stetzer said, her husband across the way said, because she had this very crooked smile, he said, I like it, it's kind of cute. And then he said, he leaned down to kiss her, and I was close enough to see how he had to twist his lips to make the kiss work. I read that and I said, Jesus, that's what you did for me. You came in my twistedness. You were twisted in agony on the cross. And you, you made the twist work. You made the kiss work. The kiss of your grace in my life. You exposed my secrets. But you handled your heart. You kissed my heart. You met me in my twistedness. You were twisted to make the kiss, the divine kiss, work. And that's Jesus. He loves you and me. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for all the barriers you've broken. We thank you that you came to our world and you made the kiss work in our lives. We thank you you were twisted to meet us in our twistedness and our sin. And you made us face our sin. You exposed our hypocrisy, our dirtiness. But you've handled your heart with su our hearts with such tenderness and grace. You made it so the kiss of God would work on our hearts and lives. And we thank you that we're changed because of it. We thank you that we're new. We thank you that we're being transformed day by day by the beauty of Jesus and the power of your spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing us and setting us free and giving us the hope of love we can't imagine that helps us to get over ourselves and get on with kissing our world and stepping into other people's worlds and breaking barriers and not being like our culture, but being like you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? Amen, amen. amen. What a joy to have been with you all. God bless you.